Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Art of Worldly Wisdom podcast. And today we have another amazing live and direct episode with you, for you, and of course, by you. Today we have Goldie Locks, who is a very unique and special guest. Not only has she had a um, long, incredible career as a veteran of the entertainment industry, um, she has had a career as an international singer, producer, songwriter. She has been at the helms of her own rock band, which has done uh, shows from all, all over the world. And she also has a background as a professional wrestler in the wrestling industry, as not only a professional wrestler, uh, also as a host and interviewer in the wrestling industry. So super unique and versatile person to have on the show. And we're going to delve into some real incredible life lessons that Goldie has to share with us today. Goldie, welcome to the show. This is exciting. I can't wait. I'm, I'm very excited for your audience and all. So here's the thing, Goldie. Before we get into some nitty gritty and really yeah. help the people watch some, uh, hear some real valuable lessons. And I have, I have some real interesting places that I want to delve into with you. Just give Ready? a little bit more about your background um, and, and a little bit who you are and what you're all about in as much detail as you can, just for those that may may have not heard of you before so, so they have a better idea. Which is probably a lot of people watching your show, Mo, and that's okay. You're so sweet. At least you didn't bring up a damn song again. I am from Minneapolis, Minnesota, born to some Harley riding hippie parents who uh, named me a very hippie name. I'm actually named after a Cat Stevens song, and we'll just leave it at that. But I go by Goldilocks, and I come by it honestly. I would break and enter into neighbors' homes because they had better food than we had, and so I felt entitled to that, therefore was named Goldilocks. So I started modeling and doing commercials and movies and jingles when I was three. I had a terminally ill mother since the day I was born whose medical bills were more, more than what were, they needed to be subsidized. And I learned at an early age in all of the entertainment that the, the cooler I was to work with Mo, the more, not necessarily, well, I get booked on more and more jobs. A lot of the younger kids would try to stretch it out so that it would bump into the next union shift. And therefore people would have to pay, pay, pay. And I figured that out. And I would literally tell the producers and the casting directors and agents, I'll get it done and under the time if you book me again. And this was at five and six years old. So needless to say, I made a, do I swear on this? Probably not. We don't swear on your show, do we? You know what? There's no rules against it, but you will be the first person to officially swear on the show. So have at it. I'm you, you, swear, you'll, you'll make you'll make history. I'm just going to say a shit ton of money and people uh -huh. can appreciate that listening for a, for an eight year old to get checks in the mail for three hundred and fifty thousand dollars at a pop was a lot of money. And I, I consider that a shit ton. So, um, yeah, I made a lot of money and kept on hustling in the um, acting and entertainment business. And that's formed uh, into the music business because I was always singing and writing and I got a really a couple of great record deals in the Minneapolis area and was mentored by some pretty amazing people. One that's not around anymore, but boy, you can learn a lot from him. And just learning from so many of the Minneapolis music royalty, it, it can't help but trickle through down into every aspect of your life. You learn some really interesting life lessons, like you, Mo, growing up really quickly and getting a lot very very soon, you know, it can go one of two ways. Yeah. Thank God we're both good and sitting here with a sound mind and brain on our on our on our body. Thank God for that. And uh, let's see. Then I got into press professional wrestling as I was a backstage interviewer. Some things hit the fan one night. It's live TV in front of millions of people, and you know, just like when we talk about wrestling with like Stone Cold Austin, you know, he was never meant to go over. He was never meant to be who and what he turned out to be but the people decided one night that he was over and then in the wrestling business that means that he was going to be popular and and in demand and uh vince was he was forced to push this guy and that's the same thing that happened with me in wrestling i was never intended to do all of the stuff that ended up happening in my career but one night uh just a very controversial off-color Comment was said on live TV and there's no turning back from that. So then I was a manager. Then I was 
uh, a wrestler. And then I, I turned into a lot of things. So, I mean, that's basically my story. Now I'm an entrepreneur and do all kinds of crazy things like you do. Not crazy, but you know what I mean? All along the, the spectrum. And I'm a happy mother trucker and I'm just thrilled to be here. Well, thank you for that. And thank you for going into so much detail. I appreciate you doing that. I want us to, t to start off with actually going into what I think is super unique and cool and a place where I think there's a lot of lessons that you learned um, and experiences that you had that I think we should document and help people. And that's the wrestling. I think okay. that, you know, uh, for those that don't know, um, uh, you were actually involved in TNA, right? And, yeah, and impact. The, uh, impact Wrestling. And, you know, we have WWF or WWE and, you know, WCW. And then there's this kind of third child, TNA, there was, there was kind of um, growing for a while and, and really holding its own with the big dogs and had a lot of momentum. And, and, and you know, as, a, as someone that's not only a fan of business, but also a fan of wrestling, I kind of um, noticed that for a while, TNA was really a legitimate competitor of WWF, which is kind of like the Coca-Cola of wrestling. So you have Coca-Cola, you have Pepsi, and then here's this third um, this third cola coming out of nowhere, sort of, and really holding its own for a while. Yeah. And you were there at, when it was really getting that kind of exposure, right? W yeah. what, what year were you involved in, in TNA? I, mean, I was the original original cast, Mo. So I started out in 2002 when it when it started. And <clears throat> speaking of wrestling, I have to interject uh, a wrestling term that we were talking about earlier is putting over. And I have to put you over, compliment you, <laughs> because said no man ever to a woman hey, thanks for going into all that detail. I mean, that was really nice of you. Most guys would just say, hey, you're talking too much, chick, shut up. So thank you. I think some of the men listening who want some really great advice, pull from Mo Rock and just the next time your chick is just yammering about and frothing at the mouth, just just try that one. Just try, wow, thanks a lot for going into detail. Well, that was unexpected. I'm still laughing about that. <laughs> then we can get back to what you were saying with that. Literally was like, that made me laugh for like the next seven years. So thank you. You could say you're really long winded or you talk too much, but if you really want to get lucky guys, just use that tip from, from Mo Rock. I don't know well, what the you said, but you said, wow, thanks a lot for going so far into detail. I'm all righty. Fine. Well, no, hey dude, guys, that was really good. I, I hope you guys watching are taking notes and, and hopefully you're taking <laughs> handwritten notes. That was so good. Thank Cause you. you had me, you had me at thanks for going into detail. So yeah. Um, it did hold its own and, and, and it continues to, and it's, it's rebranded itself. And there was a lot of, you know, um, legal things that went on with why it isn't as big as it, as it was. And, you know, it, it changed management and, you know, things happen when companies, yeah. when companies uh, shift a little bit, but it, it was a magical time. And I constantly say, I wish I could go back in time and, and do it over. I wish you I could. You were there for what? How many years were you really Many involved? years until I got fired. Wow. So were you there through up until like from 2002 to like what, 2008, 2009, 2010? A little, a little before that, a little bit before that. So yeah. at least about Glory five days. years. Glory days. Yeah. Okay. So you were there when Hulk Hogan was there, right? Mm -hmm. Wow. That's awesome. Did you have a yeah. chance to interview Hulk? I didn't interview him. Got to know him a little bit. Um, cool guy. You know, a lot of, I really had good relationships with everybody there. Like I said, I wish I could go back in time and take my, head out of my rear end and get to know people more. Now I, I think have more I, I, that. that's true. And we'll, we'll talk about that. I think the, um, at the time we had sting, right. And, and uh, Kurt angle. Mm -hmm. And, and I remember they were really big in TNA. So you really worked with some of the biggest names in wrestling and you were part of the roster officially, which I think is, is legendary. I think that's a real legendary and really in an interesting place to kind of take your career it is. Um, because you came out of what many people don't know is you kind of came out of that era of music that was very teen pop. The, a lot of people have forgotten what the late 90s, uh, early 2000 um, music business was like. I mean, we're talking um, Sugar Ray. We're talking Backstreet Boys. We're talking yeah. NSYNC. We're talking Christina Aguilera. We're talking Britney Spears. We're talking TRL, Carson Daly, right? Yeah. And that was really the... Um, image that you had as an artist early on in your career mm -hmm. um, and you went from um, you know late 90s TRL uh, style to hardcore 
wrestling and TNA in just a few years. That's a pretty serious transition as a public figure. Yeah, it was really, it was a wild ride. And a lot of people don't know this story, but I flew out to New York to, to talk to Jive Records. And um, one of the executives, I'll never forget it, his name was Jack Satter. And he was one of the VPs there. And basically there was two really big, one big deal on the table and a small one. And the big deal went to a girl who had a really big following who used to be on the Mickey Mouse Club. And I remember them saying to me, Goldie, you have a better voice, but this girl can dance and has a better following and drum roll, please. I never look at her and think like, I wonder if I would have had your life, what that would be like. I love my life. I, and I really say that not out, not out of like, oh, you got the consolation prize. I got like a million dollars. It was a good, it was a good deal. But you do, you do often wonder like at that time, I remember thinking to myself that other, I won't say the word, <laughs> interesting other girl that you mentioned, like, I was like, no one's going to ever pay attention to her. Her name is too hard to pronounce Christina Aguilera. You know, yeah. okay, I'm wrong, you know, and, um, she was kind of mean back then, you know, cause I was on the same circuit. Brittany was the nicest. It doesn't matter who you talk to. It doesn't matter what radio programmer, PD, MD, it doesn't matter. They're going to all say the same thing consistently over and over. She was the nicest person to deal with. She knew every secretary's kid's name walking into a radio station. She did it right. She was not a diva. And to this day, one of the most beloved human beings in the entertainment business because she was so freaking nice and kind. So that's a little nugget that a lot of people don't know. Interesting. Ab absolutely. And I think it's super cool. I, I personally really love that era. I'm really passionate about that era um, I'm specifically referring to that late 90s pop yeah. era because I think it had such an innocence and such a magic that we haven't had in music since. You know, I, like around 2002, you know, when 9-11 happened, it was kind of a friend of mine who was also my mentor. What year was uh, that? 2000, 2001. Okay. You know, when 9-11 happened at the end of 2001, it really was kind of also the end of that chapter of, of yeah. pop culture. You know, it, it really, by the end of 2001, it, 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 it um, and I think that it probably had something to do with it because we, we collectively went into like this um, culture of mourning. So the innocence, you know, no one was really singing, um, steal my sunshine when 9-11 happened, right? You weren't hanging around the beach saying, you know, she was lying down the beach, you know? So it kind of ended that thing. And that that whole vibe, that whole um, ride that lasted, you know, two, three years, like probably from like 97, 98, 99, 2000, 2001, especially 99. Um, and you were kind of in the epicenter of it. I know you, you were on the Jenny Jones show. Um, you were, you were, you know, kind of on the circuit. You were kind of all, you were really part of that industry at that magical time what are a few cool things and, and memories that you have um about that time because we haven't really gone back to that innocent time that was kind of like the last um the last moment of like genuine innocence that mu that, that the music industry had you know i, had, I miss it i do I too it. and i don't want to sound like like my parents always were like oh the good old days and whatnot but i mean everybody has a time in their life where they feel good it's before they get responsibilities or life actually happens and we all have songs that are that that theme song to our to our lives you know and and i again it, i wish i could just go back and fix so much stuff and the advice that i give people is get to know you get to know yourself love yourself because those times for me and in wrestling mode to be completely honest to be completely transparent with you and your listeners viewers i was jacked up back then never did any drugs and i wasn't like into alcohol but i always seemed to have some dark cloud of a son of a bitch that i was hanging out with and i know there's a lot of guys that are listening that you know they had that crazy bitch and they just hung in there thinking that she was going to change and it's like both of those eras of my life, I had a ball and chain of somebody that I should have just cut loose. And I, I go back to that time. And the first thing I think of is, is some negative stuff that I was attached to. And I wish, I wish I would have just thought, like we talked about earlier, uh, red flags. Like I wish I would have seen something and just thought, this is a red flag. I'm not even going to, it's not going to change color anytime soon. I'm not even going to enter into that relationship or that 
transaction. But, you know, hindsight is always 2020. And I, I wish that I could have enjoyed the 90s more. I wish I could have enjoyed wrestling better. But I will say something about the, the 90s. The, the fashion was was cool. The fashion was cool in the, in the 80s. You know, that yeah. was I was young during that time. But, like, there was some good things with that. The music was fun. It, you, you brought up Sugar Ray. Like, there's just so much joy. And then – yeah. Then things just shifted and they just got really funky. Yeah, yeah they did. And, and you know, I, I bring it up because I, I feel like it was the last era of pop culture that still had the innocence. I mean, if you listen to like the Beach Boys, for example, in the 60s, there's a lot yeah. of like, there's a lot of innocence in the Beach Boys. And the 80s were kind of wild and rock and roll. And then the 90s started out. Um, with bands like Nirvana grungy. in the early 90s, they were really grungy and kind of like dark and depressing. Yep. But then out of nowhere, it was it kind of it was a really bizarre thing that happened in the late 90s. And as a, a, a former music producer who has a gold record, this is a subject I'm passionate about. Um, you know, the mid 90s sort of naturally had this re, 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 you know, resurgence of that innocence, that innocent vibe. You had got you know you know you had a bunch of bands coming out of, um, you know the Lou Pearlman camp. You had, um, oh, and seeing <laughs> you you had, <laughs> you know you had and seeing and you had Backstreet Boys and then suddenly you had all these boy bands and oh TRL God. and when TRL started it was supposed to be like this cool place for rock bands but then all these kids started voting in you know, the Christina Aguilera's and the Britney Spears with this innocent music, which was a really cool moment in time. Because a lot of the, the, the songs that were hits in 1999 or 2000 would never have been hits in any other year. You know, like Steal My Sunshine by L.E.N. is a quintessential 1999 song. Like you hear that, you know, or, or like I'm Blue, right, by Eiffel 65. Like these are 1999, 2000 era songs. And I think it's really cool that you were in the business of that era. And yeah, I think it's time to go back to that. Time to go back. I hope coming out of this COVID thing, a lot of songs and singers and artists emerge with some innocent music. I think we have... What, what, what year was my, my worst enemy? What year was... That, what the, was is that Evan Essence? Lit, My Worst Enemy. Remember that song? Super poppy, fun. My Worst Enemy by Lit. I'm trying to remember what year that was. I would like to write more songs like that. Blink-182, Lit. Um, 1999, yeah. Okay, was it really? Yeah. Okay, so that's still a really rocky pop. Like, that's the kind of stuff that I really, really love. Just um, Green Day before they got too political. So yeah, yeah. Like... Yeah, Green Day. I, I loved Green Day. I think their heyday was in the 90s, like Brain Stew. I think yep. that was a really cool song. And then when they got harder, yeah. I, I liked them less. I, 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 I don't, I don't want to – well, yeah, the political, but even like the guitar riffs, you know, like I think that Green Day is at their best when they do soft rock and pop okay. rock. Okay. You know, like Time of, My, Time of Your Life or Brain Stew or things with simple riffs. I don't want to, you know, if I want to listen to Linkin Park, I'm going to listen to Linkin Park. I if I'm going to listen to Green Day, I want to listen to Green Day. I don't want to listen to Green Day doing Linkin Park. You I know what I'm you. saying? So I think that they were much better when they were a little on the soft rock side. You definitely you know? have your opinion on opinions on things. Don't mess with <laughs> rock. But anyways, it. this is not about me. This is about you. You got me going on a riff here. I'm enjoying so, it. It's good. So, so, Goldie, this. so Goldie, tell us a little bit about um, a few of the main, you know, you talk so much about, I, if I could go back in time, something yeah. you mentioned was not having that, that, that chain, that relationship, what, what, or, or, or that person in your life that might hold you back. Yeah. There's people listening that are in that situation today. Yeah. Get out, run, run for the hills to quote Judas Priest, get the hell out. I'm telling you, you know what? I'm going to be the person that sat in the Beverly center. I remember he was programming my website perfect stranger. And we had had one meeting with, here's what I want on my website. I'll never forget it. No, it was Century City Mall. I'll never forget it. It was Houston's Century City Mall. And we met and a perfect stranger looked me in the eyes and said, Goldie, it's only a matter of time. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And he's like, Goldie, the writing is on the wall. And I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, the guy that you're with. He's like, it's only a matter of time before you're not with him anymore. And oh my God. So Mo, I am financially, contractually, 
everything connected to this guy. He had intertwined himself into my entire, you know, well, my entire being, my DNA. And I'm thinking, here's this guy that I don't even know, calling out into the existence. Basically, my life is going to go upside down. And boy, did he call it out because it wasn't that long after that, sitting in my Beverly Hills penthouse at $15,000 a month, driving the vehicles and all the heyday stuff that I was just pissing money away and not investing it and being a douchebag. It was literally weeks from that where I remember being on the phone in that penthouse. It was, I won't say whose it was, like what famous star owned it before I did. And I just remember having this guy that I'm contractually bound to say to me, and it's like, you wanted to say something differently, but if that's not what came out of my mouth, I remember being on like an old fashioned, like type phone, the house phone back then in Beverly Hills. And he just said, Goldie, you don't love me like a lover. You're like my sister. You think of me like I'm your, your brother. And oh no, I don't. That's not true because I'm thinking, oh my God, what if I say what I really feel like? I'm going to lose everything that I have worked for because I didn't start out like this. And now it's this red tape mess, right? And Mo, I kid you not, I don't know what, it felt like some spirit knocked me upside the back of the head and just said, you're right. And I'm like, oh my God, those words came out. And you know what? It was like five days from that time of speaking the truth of, I do think of you as my brother. I still love you very much, but I'm not sexually attracted to you. And I don't want to have to do the things that I have to do anymore. It was like five days from then that the crap hit the fan and everything from this contract to this contract to publishing to this to that to this was getting cut and i'm like you want to talk about a covid i'm in this huge funnel this whirlwind this tornado going how am i going to pay for all this stuff so all of a sudden things got nasty my dad drove from minneapolis minnesota he flew i picked him up we got a u-haul i threw everything that i could in that and then from my my ex's place and we drove cross country and we started over in Nashville, Tennessee. I did. And it was just, it's very weird when you're in something like that. And it's a, like, it was very abusive. So you're talking about all this nineties, like fun, great stuff. And I'm just thinking, I wish I could go back in time and not do some of the things that I did, but then I wouldn't be, this is a comfort for people that are listening. And then you wouldn't be the people that you are today, the man, the woman that you are, because you didn't have those battle wounds to shape you. So shape you as you will, but then make healthy decisions for yourself now in the present that if something isn't working and if you've tried and you've gone to counseling and you've done your all, if, it's, if, it, if you're in an emotional hangover state every day where you're just drained and exhausted and you're trying everything with the other person, business partner, friend, lover, whatever, like, you know, maybe there, maybe it is time to like think of a different option. And I, I, I'm not married, Mo. I don't have kids, and I'm not in a marriage like that. So, I, I, I don't know how somebody would maneuver through that. I just know I can empathize with you, and I, I understand. And and it stinks. So, I just always want people to be happy and live their best life. And if you can leave a situation because you're codependent, get out. Maybe this is your wake up call. Listening to this today. It's okay to go pursue happiness. It's okay. Are you a better person because of the experience that you had? Absolutely, I am. So, I now know what I was a little bitchy brat <clears throat> in Beverly Hills. It was all about me. And let me just tell you, once the IRS comes after you, and once you go completely bankrupt and they take your house and your car and you can't have a credit card, you can't have any money in your bank account minus I think $30 is what the max, 60 was the max you can have when you're going through filing whatever chapter that I did. Once you get to that point and you fall flat on your face from glory and you tell nobody because I didn't want my family to know about it, you become a different person. And I wouldn't change all of that. I wouldn't change it for the world of who it made me. I just wish I could go back and be better to people. I wish I could be like the, the Christmas story when Scrooge gets to go back and, you know, redo situations and times in his life. Like, like I said, on my podcast, I keep reaching out to all these celebrities and stars that I wasn't as nice as I could have been to, or I didn't appreciate them, or I didn't even know who they were. 
I didn't know who their story was, that they were ECW, WCW. I'm like interviewing all these people and I have no freaking idea. And I tell that to people like, look up who you're going to go see on an interview for work. Look up something about that person that you're going to go out on a date with if, if they reveal who they are. A lot of times I go on dates on online dates and I don't want them to know about all this stuff. I want them to know me not all this like history and things that I've done. And then I'll talk about that, peel the onion layer layer later, you know, but get, look people up and, and, and know something about them because, because people do want to feel important and they do want to feel valuable and like they matter. And that's the biggest gift that you can give someone. And I blew it for many years. So oh. heed my advice and get to know people. So if you are a better person because of that experience, mm -hmm. was it a bad experience? Oh God, it was one of the worst. <laughs> what I went through was so incredibly brutal, but at the same time, tragically beautiful. Like I, I would say, I wouldn't wish what happened to me on anyone, but I kind of do. Because like I said, when you lose everything that you have and all you have is in a U-Haul truck, driving cross country with your dad, watching him in the car behind you in a rear view mirror, you start to realize like what really is important. And you know, what was important about that trip was stopping at a truck stop and goofing off with my dad and having him lose his rosary because we didn't have money necessarily with what we were doing to get a hotel. We were just going to plow through the whole cross country journey. And he lost his rosary because that's what you do at a truck stop mo is you stop to say the freaking rosary. We're Catholic. So, you know, we talk about that. We talk about like, I just remember like from morning to afternoon until dusk seeing my dad behind me in the rear view mirror like that's an image that's burned into my mm -hmm. memory forever like that was my dad he showed up to help me haul ass out of a bad situation and start over and that is the most valuable memory that I have and I, I wouldn't have that if, if all that other stuff you know make make something what's the therapist that I saw as a child actor you were required to see therapists because of the hours that she kept and the company that she kept one of her things that she told me was, you know what, what you're describing, Goldie, is the gift from the wound. And I think mm. that's a beautiful thing for people who have been hurt or had tragedy is like, look for, cliche as it sounds, the silver lining. What is the gift from your wound, from all the crap that you went through? There is something, like you're, you're, you're saying, there's something beautiful and good that comes out of that if you look. Absolutely. And the gift from the wound and, you know, in, in neurolinguistic programming, which I have a background in, we talk about the reframe. The and reframe. so the reframe, okay. uh, which is a shift in essentially the perspective on an experience that you may have had. So what oftentimes, uh, you know, if someone comes to me with a traumatic experience, the question is, did this experience make you a better person? Yes. And if the answer is yes, the follow-up question would be, well, was it a bad experience? Smart. Because if it makes you a better person, how could it have been a bad experience? And so, looking at it. absolutely. So in NLP, we call that a reframe. And what that does, Goldie, is it empowers individuals to really get rid of those unresolved emotional issues that oftentimes hold us back. Because it's usually the unresolved emotional issues that prevent us from being the, the person that we're capable of being. So I digress from that. So, you know, you went through this traumatic experience and this was before you got into wrestling, right? Yes, oh. it was right. Well, it was right, Mo. It was right in the middle of like, no, it was, it was, I'm trying to remember the timeline. I think this all kind of happened in the middle of all of that. In the middle of, of the wrestling. Yeah. And um, did you, uh, was the wrestling sort of something that just naturally happened or did you know oh. you wanted to one day be a professional no, wrestler? No, I was totally like, again, I'll never forget. That's a cool story about, it's a very cool story. If you have four minutes, I'll tell it to you. So people can get something from this because it's a good story. The entertainment lawyer that I had for my record deal was then also the entertainment, excuse me, the lawyer for the new promotion coming up for Impact Wrestling TNA. She was the Jarrett, Jerry Jarrett and Jeff Jarrett's lawyer. And she kept telling the manager that I had at the time that they're looking for a fresh face, somebody that doesn't necessarily have wrestling background to be the backstage interview. And he told me about it and she said, she's going to need an audition. 
um, some sort of thing that you can show like she would be good for this. So a friend of mine and I went on Santa Monica Boulevard into a singular store or something and I threw a tantrum and it's actually, you can find it out there. Um, I can't remember what it's called, but it's under Goldilocks. It's some YouTube video. Uh, so crush them, crush them cell phone. It's hysterical. And I go in with my friends up on the stairs with a hat cam and I cut a promo, which is a wrestling term for freaking out on the clerk, on the salesperson. And it's funny stuff. And I had it on a DVD and we were sitting on Sunset Boulevard at Chin Chin's with the lawyer and my then whatever you want to call them sitting to my right. And I kept saying, she's like, well, if Goldie only had something and I kept saying, I, I have something. And it was like Cinderella and he'd kick me under the table. I'm bruising and bleeding my cutting my shin. And I, but, but I have something he'd kick me again, like, shut up, don't talk. And he used everything I did with this man. This is where the abuse was. Nothing was good enough, Mo. Nothing was complete. It wasn't really a song and nothing. It just, he just was so overly micromanaging, controlling that, he didn't allow me to do anything. And I kept saying, hey, Miss Lawyer, I've got something that I think would do the trick. And he just kept kicking me. And then finally, I'm like, well, I'm already bleeding all over. There's nothing more he can do other than kick me so hard it exposes bone, whatever. And I finally took, took out of my purse and I said, here's my DVD. And that got the Jarrett's attention. Then the next step is, as I always say, God helps those who help themselves. You can't just sit back and expect all of this great stuff to happen. You have to be proactive. So I decided from, I guess I was living in Los Angeles at the time that I was going to apply to Nashville, Hendersonville, if you will, which is close to where I live now, ironic. And I was going to just show up at the Jarrett's wrestling office. I found out where it was, got a cab, whatever. There wasn't Uber back then. There wasn't any lifts. And I showed up and they're like, what are you doing here? And I said, I want the job. And we talked and whatever, and there was nothing. And I went back to LA and I decided to get on a plane again. And I think several more times I got on a plane and came to Hendersonville, Tennessee, saying, you've seen me work, you've seen my audition, I'm good on the mic, I can speak, I want it. And Jeff Jarrett looked me in the face and he laughed at me. And he showed me a stack. Back then, there wasn't a lot of internet stuff. It was, if you want the job, you send in an 8 by 10 glossy with a resume stapled to the, stapled to the back. And there was a stack about this high manila envelopes hundreds of women wrestling background with this background the next thing modeling porn stars you name it and he said goldie look at these women and look what they look like and look at you and i said what do you mean look at me he said well you're not exactly endowed like they are and i was like i take offense to that sir and i walked over to a bowl on the coffee table and back then they had those decorative gourds it was like a styrofoam ball with seeds on them or something or vines wrapped in a ball and they had all this stuff and i just remember taking two of the most supple gourds that i could find and sticking them down my shirt and pushing them up and i said there you go gentlemen how is that for you now i can compete but I said, as big as my boobies are, and as fake as they are now, like all of the other chicks in your manila envelopes, I'm gonna tell you one thing that I have that they don't have. And they both looked at me and I had their attention. And they said, what's that? And I looked around and I said, I don't see any of these bitches here. I don't see any of these girls here. This is the third time that I've gotten on a plane and I've come here unannounced, soliciting you saying, I want this job. I don't see anybody. And it was Memorial Day. It was like, a, it was a holiday, Labor Day or Memorial Day, somebody, something where Jesus comes out and sees a shadow. I don't know. But I made the point to them and I said, there's nobody else here. And you know what? We went to dinner, lunch, and they gave me the job. But it was the tenacity and it was showing that you really want something which is missing from society. And it is missing from these kids that are the 1920s and the millennials. I don't know what's going on out there with mm -hmm. these freaks. But you got to go after what you want and it's not going to be just given into you. You're not just going to get a trophy in life. You're not just going to be given, given, given. The stimulus check, that's a one-time gimmick. That was great for a lot of people that really needed it. But that's not a constant. And don't expect that because we're $2 trillion in the hole now because of that. Again, a lot of people needed that. But that, isn't, that shouldn't be the norm. Yeah. Hustling should be the norm. So that's how I got that job. And, and, and I remember it like... Like yesterday, that's how I got it. Such an interesting story. Such an amazing story. And, and that is what it takes. And that, what you just shared is exactly what it takes. A lot of people ask, hey, how did you make it? How did you do it? How did you make it happen? Stories like that. 
you know, being persistent with the right individual in the right situation, that's what it takes. It takes audacity. It takes persistence. It takes tenaciousness. It takes thinking outside of the box, not let me send in a resume and let me send in a picture of myself. It isn't going to happen. Do you remember Trinity, Action Trinity from TNA? Vaguely, sure. She was the, look her up, she's the most incredible, she's a stunt woman. She was Jennifer Garner's stunt woman, mm-hmm. stunt double, she, amazing. And she was on my podcast a year ago and actually told me the story of, she decided that she wanted to wrestle. She showed up backstage at TNA. Um, I think she learned how to wrestle in three weeks of wrestling school. Like she hired a tutor and it was like, there's no way that you're going to be able to learn how to wrestle in three weeks going to this pay-per-view for TNA or whatever, the house show. There's no way. And she's like, I'm going to practice every day. And she did it. And she showed up and she went backstage. And I think they told her to sue because they girl. And she suited up and went out there and she got that contract. Like absolutely mind blowing, crazy. Just focus on what it is that I want and I'm going for it. Absolutely. And you know, a lot of people watching this are entrepreneurs. Maybe they have a startup. Maybe they want to get into business. The lessons uh, that you're sharing apply to that as well. Absolutely. Whether it's wrestling industry, whether it's the technology space, it really doesn't matter. Fill in the blank. We're talking about a, a, a quality called tenacity, grit, not taking no for an answer. You know, really it cre- mean creepy either. You don't want to be doesn't creepy. mean creepy, but what it does mean is when you're in the right situation, you have the social intelligence and awareness to know that the way you're about to go about it actually benefits you. You knew in that room what you did was appropriate because of yes. the environment, yes. because yes. of the vibe. You had the social awareness to get to know that. You know, I, I'll give you an example. A lot of times, you know, when I was much more active in the music industry, something that I hated was if I was sitting at a hookah bar and someone that I didn't know would come up to me and act like they were my best friend because they're an aspiring singer and that they somehow think that by acting that way, I'm going to turn them into a star. I hated it when that would happen. And it's part, you know, it's, it's actually part of the reason why I stopped putting myself out there like that because those experiences, although you think you want to have those experiences when you're outside looking in, Once you make it in the business, you're like, I, I, what the hell is this? I don't even know you. Why are you talking to me like you're my best friend? Oh, not because you're interested in being my best friend, because you have something that you want. You want something from me. Um, And and that turned me off. And and, and then it's not like I had no interest in building a relationship with that person after that. But if they went out on a limb the way that you did and showed value, the way that you did and actually express that, Hey, I could actually be of service to what it is that you're doing like you did. Then the doors would have been open um, from, from, you know, from a perspective of starting a relationship because it really comes down to building real relationships with people, whether it's in life or whether it's in business. And you've talked a lot about that. You've talked about how relationships can hold you back. You've talked about how building the right relationship can help you have a quantum leap in life. And it seems like that's really something goldy that, from our interactions, you're very well versed in understanding. Have you ever thought about helping people with their relationship problems? Because Lord knows there's a lot of people with a lot of problems that you can help solve in that space. Yes, I have. As a matter of fact, Mo, my good friend Mo Rock (laughs) was just giving me some really great ideas. And that's why I can't wait to go buy your book on Amazon right now just because you really seem to know what you're talking about. Um, I'm starting a new Patreon channel where there is some of that in that. And then of course it will segue into different um, areas that are more concentrated on that. Again, I really think first off, I'll say never underestimate the power of gourds. Thank you. But uh, I, I think that a lot of things with relationship coaching and whatnot, even though I've never been married, I've had some really wonderful relationships and dated some wonderful men. And I think a lot of that stems from confidence. And that is something that I definitely love to, and I know I'm qualified to help, especially men with women too, but I have a soft spot for men because men get a bad rap. And I hung out with so many dudes in sports entertainment and in, in sports in general. And I think the only reason that men are as crappy as sometimes they get the rap for is because some chick like, messes them up at an early age. I think we're, I think girls can be, girls can be kind of evil. Like I'm just calling it for what it is. Like there's usually some guy gets tainted because of some 
thing that some girl on the playground or somebody humiliates them or somebody does something to them. And I like, I have a soft spot for guys. And it, it's funny, the, the video that we were talking about, there's a lot of great comments on it. Video for suicide prevention, it's out all to you. There's a lot of great comments on that, Mo. There's a lot of wonderful comments that are going to help people that are in a dire need or depressed or they're blue or they're feeling bad during the COVID or with what, what's going on socially right now. But the most beautiful thing about that video and the comment section was this. And this is why I have a soft spot for men. There was a guy that the minute that that debuted on Vince Russo's channel, Vince Russo of Russo's brand, well, of course, everybody that subscribed to Russo brand is going to get a notification that there's a new video well they're going to listen to some trash talk about wrestling they yeah. were not expecting a goldilocks music video for suicide prevention right and this guy got on there mo and just shot it to to pieces and said all of this mean stuff like what it was just like venom and i'm like I'm in such a good place right now. Mm -hmm. Like the confidence level oozes out of me mm -hmm. that I'm just like, I'm going to get on there and turn this around. Right. And I, and I told him, I said, wow, you're such a great looking guy from your avatar. I'm really surprised. And I just, Mo, if you go there, you'll see all of these responses between the both of us. But the original con comment has been re uh, not rejected and removed. There's another word for it. Like retracted. Like it, it sunk in so much. Like instead of getting mad at this guy, I cut a promo on him and made him realize what he did because I think a lot of guys that are having issues with their dating lives or their relationships, if you just give them a chance and like very constructively give them some, some tips on what to do, I think it can be a game changer. With I you. think that you have a whole... A, a maximum level of value that you can provide for men that are struggling in the relationship department. And I think that it would be a huge service if you were to offer that to people as a service, because I think that you would be phenomenal at helping that. So those watching that might have relationship question, I know Goldie, um, she, she's very accessible, even though she's a public figure, I'm sure you can reach out to her with that. But I want to um, go back to something that came up when, when you were discussing that negative, nasty hate or comment. Yeah. Um, Abraham Maslow, who of course came up with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, once said something very, fun, very fascinating. He said that self, the self-actualized individual is the individual that is free of the good opinion of other people. Say it again. The, the, the self-actualized individual. The, let's just say the, the free person, the person that's powered and empowered and free is the person that is free from the good opinion of other people. What that means, Goldie, is to really, to, to really get to that place as an artist, as a business person, as anything that, as a person that creates, it's not just about n being detached to the haters or being detached to the negative opinion. Yeah, no, it's Buddhist. It's, it's being detached to even the good opinion, yeah. right? So if I put out a song and someone says, and by the way, I, I experienced both sides of that, right? I know, I know what it feels like to be praised by millions of people, and I know what it feels like to be hated on by millions of people, mm -hmm. right? I, I've actually lived both of those experiences, which I'm so grateful for, because very few people can walk out of both of those experiences without it, uh, you know, <laughs> without needing a, a life raft <laughs> going off the boat. But I digress from that. The point that I'm making is Abraham Maslow said, to be free from the good opinion of others is the self-actualized individual. Actually, when, I agree. when you can put something out and not be affected by a thousand people saying, I love this, I love this amazing work, or a thousand people saying, I hate this, I hate this, but focusing on what it is that you're here to do, which is create. Yeah. Just the creation process, not the result, but the actual process. And as an artist who spent a lot of time in the studio, would you agree that when you just focus on the process, it ends up being so much more fulfilling than when you focus on how it's going to be uh, accepted. I agree. I agree. Um, I also, believe it or not, I have massive blonde hair underneath this do. Uh, I believe I get, I get excited by numbers and I get excited by not that they're loving on me, but that's something that I created or worked on with a team is hitting a nerve with, people I, I i really do enjoy that mm. but it's not in the vain way that you're you're saying it's more like 
I knew if I did this, this would work. Or I knew if I crafted this right and correctly and got a lot of help and input that it could do this or that. Like I do enjoy that, but not in the way that you're thinking of just like, Oh, everybody loves me. Yeah. Like, that's not, that's not it at all. I Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about that Patreon. I think that's super exciting. Um, you, you have some real great content for people on there and I, I know yet, so I can't wait to launch it yet. There's some other Goldilocks on there that I think people are signing up. For. <laughs> I, I hope she gives a, a commission check. <laughs> right. <laughs> We're doing all this promo for but you. Her. Know what? Listen to me. You make a good point because the old me years ago would have been freaked out that there already is a Goldilocks on Patreon. What am I going to do now? The me that I'm at, I literally thought to myself, when I saw that, good for her. I know she's getting, because people are like, I just signed up and I'm like, I don't mind. <laughs> and I'm just thinking like, at least that chick is getting a little kick. Maybe she really needs that. I don't have mine yet. Let her, at least she's going to get one month of people. That's so, nice. That's actually really nice of you. By the way, I can't help but notice, Goldie, you got some real nice guns. I used to. Like, no, used to no, there's still some guns over oh, there. Help, do, you, do you work out daily? I do, and I think I'm, I'm getting back to my TNA, but better, like, because I, I, I was thinner, mm -hmm. like I was 25 pounds less, but um, I want to be that thin again, but have, be jacked, do the, do, do the women, guess. do the women that juice, do they juice up too? Of course they do. Yeah. And of course, if they have insane bodies, if they do. My mom, like I mentioned, was terminally ill my whole life. Mm -hmm. She died finally not of her Crohn's disease, but of kidney failure. Mm. And her kidney failure due to pregnisone, which is steroids. I won't, I won't touch that stuff. Even when people are like, "I'm healthy cycling," I'm like, "You're gonna die." So mm. Listening to this, there's my tip to you. It's just not a good idea. The wrestlers all die 45 to 50. Yeah. Not only are they doing steroids, but they're using growth hormones or and drug or painkillers and yeah. alcohol and you, your body just says no way i mean the, you can get pretty big naturally right absolutely and if you want to see some really great guys go follow some of the vegan mm. which is a mind blower vegan uh fitness experts like online on instagram on social they're doing it right and they're doing it with mac pros i have a friend of mine that you can reach out to his name is chris henderson he's in three doors down and he was actually in our video. He started me on macros, which is. He was in the band Three Doors Down? Yeah, he's the guitarist. Oh, that's Peter. awesome. He was in the video that you were so kind to help awesome. me with. He was the military Marine. And, you know, he definitely has those, those combinations of your body type, your blood type, what you need to really. Because it's got to be custom. It can't just be like one size custom. fits all. I freaking love it. And I'm also involved with. Um, goldiecares.com which is some really amazing products that are custom to you it's id life it's you take a an assessment or a dna test and it comes back and you'd be so surprised at everybody's body is different and you mm -hmm. can't do one size fits all for nutrition it's yeah amazing. and it's amazing you know there i was looking into different ways to get protein besides meat i like meat i'm a meat yep. eater i think there's a time and place for that but i do think it's good to have a balanced diet and i was shocked at how many protein sources there are yes i, mean, I was shocked i was more? shocked at um seitan like this how much protein is in seitan there's carbs in that though so that's the only thing that's together with you looking at carbs but i will and say chickpeas yes. and all this i'm like so wow do you know the big green vegetable that has the most protein in it that's why I'm excited to find out. This is why it's not, it's not going to change. This is why Arnold Schwarzenegger, this is why Stallone, this is why Cena, like all mm. the guys that I with in my career and still do, it's the same old different day. It is grilled chicken breast with broccoli. Broccoli has the most protein for a green vegetable. You're getting all fiber. It's a pretty low carb and you're getting like a ton of protein in it. So when you have a chicken breast or salmon or tilapia or cod is the best white fish to have it all a wild caught cod and broccoli. If you want to have that three or four times a day, you come see me in 30 to 60 days because you will look freaking amazing. You said broccoli? Broccoli is huge for protein. Really? Yes. So, so, so good old fashioned broccoli is the, the way to go. Broccoli and then go to, go to the dollar store and get yourself some Mrs. Dash substitute, some sort of sodium free 
um, seasoning and load it in. I tell people all the time, the first thing I do when I start working with them from Goldie Cares, some products and I send them to the Walmart or mm -hmm. to buy uh, a, a food steamer. Buy a food steamer and it's got two tiers in it. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and put your broccoli on the top, put your white fish on the bottom, put some seasoning on it, a little spray oil, set it and forget it. 20 minutes later, your meal is done. Pop oh, it. Are you it's talking about one of those, um, those like Classy. rice cook those rice cookers? It's like a rice cooker. It's a double decker. Um, it's a, just a food steamer. You put the water in it. You put the plastic tears on it in the top and you steam your food. You don't even need to think about it. Do you, do you, are, are you picky about what kind of uh, fish they eat? Like, do, do you think it makes a difference where the fish comes from or? or? Um, I think that wild fish is going to be better than something that's farmed with yeah. lots of, uh, chemicals in it. And then of course, salmon is good, but it's got you know, the omega-3, which is a good, a good fat, but you don't want it every day. Um, mm. And then there's a lot of mercury and salmon and tuna as well. So, so basically what you're saying is really, it's simple stuff. You don't have to be super crazy oh, or complicated. Well, yeah, Broccoli, it, it, fish. I mean, it's not, there's not like a super secret, amazing. Oh, ground turkey, um, um, all your green vegetables, any of the darker, the green, the better for you it is. The more weight you're going to lose, the more protein, more muscle you're going to build, the more muscle that you have. Uh -huh. the more energy that you have if you're going to go weight train that's in your system for 72 hours if you're going to do cardio that's going to stay in your system for 24 hours that's why a lot of the guys that look the way that they do they're not necessarily doing all of that cardio the dna test that you take from goldiecares.com will tell you do you need to be doing more cardio or do you need to be lifting more if people listening could do 30 minutes of lifting get some weights even at your house the basement side room and lift so that Arnold's way of lifting is he doesn't even count reps. He lifts uh, per each um, gen. So maybe it's eight, maybe it's 20. I'm looking, at, Gold, I'm looking at goldiecares.com. There's so much incredible. Uh, but the custom, well, you, at the top, it says take the assessment. And yeah. you know what? I took the assessment five different times as mm -hmm. five different people and answered it different ways to see, is it going to come back the same? No, it depends on how much sun you get all day. It depends on if you're sedentary or if you're moving around or if you're this or if you're that. People don't even realize that they don't manufacture vitamin C. Your body needs vitamin C. And some people don't realize that you don't manufacture that. You have to either get it from a supplement or an orange or a, 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 a tomato or a, yeah. a banana. Like, you need certain things. And so supplements are good to fill in the nutritional gaps when you're not eating what you should, or you're on the road, or you're not going to get that well-balanced meal. Don't think all that stuff doesn't matter. And if you want to get laid and you want to be hot, then start treating your body like the temple that it is and stop putting in crap. You can't Absolutely. Put in crap. People put in crap. I'm so passionate about it. You're putting in crap that they embalm dead people with. That's what people are drinking half the time. They're getting an energy drink, and it's the same thing that you put into Aunt Clara when she passes away. Do you really want to put that into your body? You want to ingest that? No, I don't. There you go. I agree. Uh, I agree. And I, <laughs> no, I agree. And, and I think that's so awesome that people listening can hear that. And I hope that people really realize how authentic you are and what a real I'm person you are legit, and how much value you have for people physically relationally, especially in those two categories. I think that there's a lot of value you have to, to provide to help people physically and with the relationships. And I hope that you, I hope that a lot of people that need relationship advice and relationship help do reach out to you. Cause I think you have the answers um, for that. And I definitely, I definitely advocate you as a relationship coach. I just, you know, I think that um, you, you are a premier world renowned relationship coach may not even realize it yet, but definitely, oh. definitely know that, that I see that in you. So we want to be respectful of your time and wrap this up, but please give people a way that they can find you, contact you and uh, get in touch with you. You know, the easiest way is to just find me, um, on, uh, Goldilocks, G O L D Y L O C K S mm -hmm. Goldilocks rocks on Instagram. If you want some other advice, just Goldie with a Y, G-O-L-D-Y, Goldilocks Fitness at Gmail. I'm so easy to find. There are literally hundreds of pages out there and they're all kind of linked. So check me out, Goldilocks Rocks on Instagram, Twitter, mm -hmm. or you've got my email now, Goldilocks Fitness. I heard, uh, I heard a rumor, Goldie, that oh, there is a, uh, a re-release of a classic oh pop song God. that oh. you are that you are doing with your new band 
and you're actually going to be recording the song called Jim. Kiss. Uh, I heard a rumor you're going to be recording a song I'm called Kiss. I'm going to show up where you live and smack you. <laughs> and, and I hear I hear that you're going to be re-recording this and putting it out there. Um, when do you think that'll be re-released and put out there? Just because ASAP, because I've heard about it now all damn day, Mo Rock. I'm okay. going to bring up some well, ear ghosts. We're, 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 su- we're super cool. excited about the new cover. Of course, I'm talking about the song Kiss, which is available on Amazon. Um, you guys can look up Goldilocks Kiss. I think it's an amazing hit song amazing pop song and we're going to do a 2.0 release right we're re-releasing it and we're super excited about that i can't wait i can't wait you're hysterical mo rock thank you i can't wait to go check out your book right now i'm going to put it on my vanity url on amazon's best seller books that i love recommend it i can't wait to see more about what you're about i should have bought it already so i apologize Makeup. Goldie, we love you. We appreciate you. We'll have you back on the show a second time. We'll, we'll have you back so we can talk more about um, some of the other incredible work that you're doing. And until next time, this was the one, the only, the original Goldilocks. You may have heard stories about her growing up on your bed. Um, you may have heard. Um, you may have heard. Uh, you may have heard some some bedtime stories about Goldilocks, but we got her live. We got her live and in the flesh for you guys. So thank you, Miss Goldie. Until next time. Don't go to the one with the <laughs> Until next time, we appreciate you. Thanks, Mo.